thank you so much for greeting one another. It's a pleasure to have you do that and see some friends and, and uh, meet folks. Um, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Do you believe that today? Testing one, two? All right, that's good. So I want to get started here, and if you were here last week, you might remember that we had Pastor John kick off a sermon series, and we are spending this month and next month, teaching through the book of Philippians. So today we're going to talk through the second half of Philippians chapter 1 in a message that I've titled, Dead, One Way or Another. And I'm going to start this way. Here's a question I have for everyone. So if I can just uh, maybe catch eye contact with some of you. Here's a question. Ready? Ready for the question? Have you ever had a bad day? Anyone in the room ever had a bad day? Yeah, that's, I'm glad that's not the most exuberant I've seen you today. But anyway, we've all had a bad day. I have a friend who actually was trying to help out at uh, his home church, and he was driving a bus to camp, uh, and he was driving all these like young people to camp. And on the way to, from the church to camp, he got a speeding ticket, okay? And then on his way home from the camp to the church, he actually on the same trip got a second speeding ticket, and he knows what it's like to have a bad day, even if it's his own fault. Who can identify? Not with the speeding, but they cause their own trouble, right? Okay. Um, I can remember in in the 80s, uh, who remembers the 80s? Anyone? Come on. Let's just take a moment and relish our memories of the 80s. Hey, the 80s uh, was a time where we had some some difficulty and a, a big recession, and you might remember we've had uh, some since then. Uh, however, uh, my dad was laid off, and he spent some time being laid off uh, for a while, and it made it difficult for our, our family, and, and the day of the layoff was a bad day, but it kind of created a difficult season, right? You can identify with this, but there's, I'm going to tell you a story about one particular bad day. I was uh, a guest preacher at, in a um, uh, like a retreat, and I was playing basketball with some teenagers, and, and I, you know, you ever feel like, like you're doing more than you're capable? Who can understand what I'm talking about, right? That was me, you know, and I, I was doing more than I was capable to doing, of doing, and we were on the basketball court, and I just want to set it up like this, that the basketball court was up, and there's like a hill that rolled down, okay? And I was, I was, I was running, like I was running like I knew what I was doing I was running on this basketball court. And, and a play happened, and I'm diving for a ball. Now, mind you, I'm like twice the age of, of these young people there. And, and I, 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 I don't know, I tried to save the ball. It's, it's actually a little bit of a blur. But I, I, I was running, and I, I tried to save the ball. And, and my momentum, who knows what momentum is? <laughs> it kept me rolling right off off the basketball court. And remember I said there was a hill? While I was rolling down the hill, what I left out is at the bottom of the hill is a lake. And, and I rolled down the hill. In, I'm the guest speaker. And I rolled into the lake. How many of you know that's a bad day? That's a bad day. Well, I get out, and what do you do? What do you say? I don't know what happened, but, but that was a bad day. The Apostle Paul knows what it's like to have a bad day. Paul was living part of his life, and he was actually in prison, but he was in prison not because he was running too fast on a basketball court, not because he was the one guilty of speeding. He actually was in trouble for doing something good. How many of you can relate to that, right? You ever ever had somebody mistreat you when you're actually doing what is good, what is sound, what is biblical? This was Paul. He was in prison because he was telling people about Jesus. This is why he was there. And, and in that, he, he said, I rejoice. So I just want to pause for a minute. He was doing what was right, and he was thrown in prison for doing what was right, and he was mistreated for it, but he had a rejoicing in his spirit. And the reason that he was rejoicing is because the gospel of Jesus was proclaimed. And we learn this invaluable lesson that the mission that God has for the church to promote the good news of the gospel is more important than even being in trouble for something that you did, but it wasn't wrong. It, it was, it's an intriguing principle. Paul, Paul at that moment was filled with, with hope. So he's in prison, 
but he's filled with, with hope. It says in Philippians 1.6, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. He had this hope that although he was in prison now, that the seeds that he planted spiritually would germinate and produce a harvest. So Paul had a hope that the gospel would, would be fruitful. But he also had a hope that he would be released. It says it right in Scripture. I'm confident I'm going to get out of this joint. That's a, not a direct quote, but it's pretty close. And he says, I'm confident I'm going to be set free from this. But we learn from Paul in the, in the story, in the middle of a, of a bad day, a bad season, that he has this perspective. See, this is the, the sermon series. It's called Perspective. And we learn that, that in the midst of trial, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of of trouble, that we can have a perspective that is a biblical perspective. See, Paul did not see God's activity through the lens of his circumstance. He did not see God's activity in the lens of his circumstance. He did not see um, all of the work of God from the view that he was in prison. Rather, he saw his circumstances through the lens of God's activity. He said, God's at work, and, 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 and because God's at work, I might be in jail, but I'm keeping my eye on the fact that God is at work. And so he did not see God's activity through his circumstance. He actually saw his circumstances through God's activity, through God's purpose. There's a story of a, a great world missionary. His name is Jim Elliott. You might have heard of him. In fact, if you like Wikipedia in this moment, you probably go there right now and do a fact check to see if I'm telling you the truth. And as long as you're there, you can hit mynorthwest.church forward slash bulletin. You could see all of our announcements, all of our sermon notes. You sign on our YouTube. You can interact with people right now. Thank you for watching online, by the way. But there's a story about a man named Jim Elliott. And it's interesting. Actually, Jim Elliott went to Wheaton College, which is, is not, not too far from here. And, and he graduates, and he, he goes into ministry, and Jim Elliott was a missionary to, to unreached Indians in Ecuador. So this is where he went, and he's serving in Ecuador, and, and he began to tell people about, about Jesus. He actually was providing food and friendship, and eventually he started telling people about Jesus, and he built relationships with, with people, he and his friends. What's in, incredible about this story is although he felt he was making relational advancement, the Indians in Ecuador turned on, on Jim and killed him and all of his friends. Now keep in mind, what was Paul doing? Paul saw his circumstances in light of God's activity. So I'm going to fast forward Jim Elliott's story to his wife, Elizabeth. You know, Elizabeth did not look at the circumstance of looking at her husband and she didn't see God's activity through that lens. What she actually did is she saw God's activity through the lens of my circumstances are I lost my husband. How do I know that? Because Elizabeth, the wife, even though her husband and all of their college friends were killed by the people they were serving, she actually went to Ecuador and promoted the gospel with, with herself and in others. And, and many, many people that were Ecuadorian Indians, gave their life to Jesus and followed him. Her life was different forever after losing her spouse. I'm, I'm sure she wondered, is it worth it? And, and I, hope, I hope it just, his, 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 his emphasis mattered to somebody. But Elizabeth said, I want to see God's activity is what's happening. And we're just here to serve. And she proclaimed the good news and carried the mission. What's interesting is I want you to hear this statement. She gave her anxiety of losing her husband to the Lord. That, that's an intriguing truth. You know, when you have such a loss, it's, it's human nature to be anxious. I actually contend that, that this is just my idea. I'm not trying to spiritualize this, but it seems as if a spirit of anxiety has encapsulated our whole culture. And I know sometimes when we deal with anxiety, some people uh, leverage medication to work on that, and some, that, that's a great help. Some uh, also might work with a counselor, that's a great help. But we can't lose sight of the fact that, that like Elizabeth Elliot, we can place the anxieties of our life in the hands of God. 
We might work with a counselor. We might work with a group or a friend. We might have medicine. But we can't overlook the fact that God is more powerful, not only than all of those helps, but he's more powerful than our anxieties. We need to do the same thing that, that Elizabeth did. And what she did is she was able, even in light of her circumstances, to continue the mission. It's amazing that God's mission is that important. We all, we all face difficult circumstances. You know what's interesting? And I've heard people say this, you know, hey, Christian, if, if you just pray, it'll all work out. Anyone ever heard advice like that? Just, just pray to the Lord, it's going to all work out. I don't believe that. The Bible says that God will work all the things together for your good, but he didn't say that everything in life just works out. We still have suffering in our life. We still have loss in our life. What we are not commanded to do with Scripture is be spiritual enough to pray away all the negative. But what we do do because of the Word of God is we can be spiritual in the negative. And we can acknowledge the fact that even in a negative circumstance, from my perspective, God is still at work. God still has a purpose. God still has mission. And he wants to use us, even in our hurts, even in our brokenness. That's how much he loves us. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, says, you share these words. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he might exalt you. Now, catch this one. Doing that, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Did you hear that? We can cast our anxieties on him, our cares on him, because he cares for us. So instead of being anxious, the Bible says we should be sober-minded. Instead of being anxious, we should be watchful. It's your adversary, a devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So, so what we need to be is sober-minded and watchful and cast our anxieties and cares on God because God already has the victory. That, that's why we do that. The Bible teaches us how to pray during life's difficulties. We can, we can acknowledge difficulties. I mean, maybe everyone in this room has lost a loved one who has passed away. That's a difficult season to navigate. I mean, you know, it, it could be years later, decades later, and these memories pop up, and there are moments that that circumstance grips your life. We understand that. There's, there's some, some who face a, a real strenuous time of sicknesses and illnesses. There are some, maybe in this room, maybe watching online, maybe you, who have been a victim of a certain situation that people know about, or it might be so private, maybe nobody knows, but the wounds and the hurts are still there. Cast your anxiety on him. Some of us know what it's like to have a difficult circumstance by losing a job or being unfairly accused. Maybe, maybe being a victim of abuse. Maybe, maybe we've gone through a divorce. You know, you can go through a divorce and because of abuse, maybe, or who knows why, why, why that would happen. And you could be married to the right person right now, but you know it still hurts. And, and I'm not here to, to judge your behavior. I'm here just to acknowledge the fact that we all live life and there are hurts. But what's amazing is if all we do is base our, our perspective on circumstances, then, then depending on how good of a day we're having or how bad of a day that we're having, that there, we're all, where, there will our spirit be. So, you know, life has a lot of good things, too. I mean, it's not just doom and gloom. I mean, some of us are married, and we're not just married, but we're happily married. Men, you just missed a great opportunity to shout amen. Some of us are happily married. I just heard more ladies than men right there. Anyway, there must be some great men in the house. That's what that means. Some of us experience God calling us to do ministry and serving, and not just as a, a pastor, but to, to, to lead us and guide us in places, and we know that, that that's God working. Some of us, quite frankly, have just had a good day because, you know, at some point we got a raise or a promotion. How many of you know that that's good news? But if all we do is base our happiness on some good news, that does not equate to spiritual maturity, right? So it doesn't matter that we have good days or bad days, it matters in who our hope is in. 
the Lord. Our faith is greater than our negative and our positive circumstances. It's stronger. You know what's, what, what is, is hard for, for this pastor is I've seen so many people limit the activity of their faith because they're looking through the lens of their circumstance. Their faith is only as strong as their circumstance. That's why we must learn from Paul that we must look at our circumstances through the lens of God's activity. That should be what's setting the spiritual pace in our life. Paul was in prison. He was in prison for preaching the gospel, but he was rejoicing. Why? Because Christ was proclaimed. And, and we learn later, we'll, we'll preach this passage uh, at, the, at the end of the series, Philippians chapter 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And then he says, I'm going to reiterate it, rejoice. He's saying it doesn't matter the circumstances. What matters is your walk with the Lord. And he's going to take the good and he's going to take the bad and he'll form it for your benefit and the glory of the Father. That's what he does. So today, I want us, I want us to look at, and I'm not going to read every verse, but, but chapter 1 of Philippians, chapter 1, verses 19 to 30. I'm going to actually read the last couple words of verse 18. If you're following along, in your Bible, I'm at Philippians chapter 1, or if you want to scroll on an app or whatever you have, some of these verses will be on the screen. Yes, I will rejoice, Philippians 1, 19, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus, this will turn out for my deliverance. Remember, he's in prison. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Death, one way or the other. See, first of all, he had hope, that he had expectation, that he would be set free, that he would be delivered. His priority, his priority was Christ being honored, whether he was dead or alive, in prison, out of prison, Remembered, not remembered. The goal was Christ glorified. Philippians 1.20, it's my eager expectation and hope that I will not be ashamed, but, the, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether li by life or death, for to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. If I am to live by, if I am to live in the flesh, this means fruitful labor for me. Yet, which shall I choose? I cannot tell, life or death. For to me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. What he's saying is, it would be better to experience a physical death so I could literally be with Jesus. Like I live my life this way, I'm seeing this to the right perspective. It's all about knowing him. It's all about sharing him. I would be better off in heaven with him. This is what he's saying. This is why we're encouraged with, with our communion fact at the end that he's coming back to take us to be with him. It's what we long for. It's what we aspire for. But what Paul learns through his experience is although he, he did not at this moment yet experience physical death, he understood what, what we, we can call spiritual death. He was going to be dead one way or the other, physically or spiritually. See, salvation, we hear this word, it's kind of a word you hear in church. It's, it's a word outside of church, to be saved from something, a salvation. What that means is, is everything in our life has gone away, it's old, and we, we say that we are, you ever heard this phrase, born again? You ever heard, who's heard that phrase, I'm born again? It's, it's a new birth in Christ. It means that, that you are a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. That happens because of the debt that we celebrated in communion, the debt that Christ pray, paid on the cross. And, and because, because he died for our sins, we might be spiritually dead, but at the same time, we're spiritually alive. Like, it's like we're living dead men or women. We're, we're living but dead. We're dead to ourselves, but alive in Christ. And Paul says, if I live that way, thinking spiritually, I'm going to have fruitful ministry. But the truth is, if I had to tell you the truth, I'd rather just be with Jesus. He said to be with Christ is better, 
But, but what's interesting in this passage, you could read it, it says, but to be with you is necessary. I, I find that so intriguing. When I, when I, I, I kind of, you know, studied through this passage, what he basically was saying was, it's, actually, let me read it to you. Philippians 1, 25, 26, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for the progress and joy in the faith, so that in me, you will have ample cause to glorify Jesus because of my coming to you again. See, he said, it's necessary for me to be here. Like, I want to die physically to be with Jesus, but I'm going to be with you. And why is that? For two reasons. One, to carry out the mission of God, to, to go into all the world, to tell people about the love of Christ. But secondly, to disciple believers. It says go into all the world, but the assignment is to make disciples. And he says, I, I'm going to be with you because I'm going to keep going, but I'm also going to go to you. I want to help you, and I want to get you to the point that you are going for others. See, spiritual growth is passing on a perspective that we must see our circumstances through the lens of God's activity and purpose. So when I think about Philippians chapter 1, the second half, I want us to think about to live as Christ, to live as purpose, its mission, its God-given assignment. And, and we learn from Paul that we should give ourselves to being truly alive in Christ, to the point that we're pouring into other people. We're, we're, we're taking people that know Jesus and helping them be more like him. And we get so excited that, that, that we're going to tell people who might not even know who Jesus is so they can see the hope in the future that God has for them. And we keep giving our life to that so we are alive in Christ. And I want to tell you, as a church, we're alive. As a church, we're alive. As a believer, you are alive. You can only live by being dead to yourself. And truly, you will be dead one way or another. But until your physical death, can we die to ourselves so we can be alive in him? Perspective. 